Greetings, and we're going to finish this lecture on microbial ecology. Okay, and some of this is going to be re uh, basically repetitious with um, the solid mass waste uh, lecture, which I did beforehand, or some of your work that you may have encountered in general bio one. So let's get started. I have to understand that microorganisms on Earth have been around for approximately 4 billion years. As such, they occupy every possible environment. Microbial activities allow life on Earth. They help capture energy, cycle nutrients, maintain fertile soil, decompose dead organisms, and pollutants. Less than really Really, less than 1% of microbial species have been successfully grown in culture. Now, you have to understand that there's a lot more that we see out there, but the problem is culturing it separately can be very difficult. Uh, growth in some of the pure cultures are under controlled conditions that promote optimal growth. Great. But in nature, organisms grow in close associations with other species, many times in biofilms, and also that nutrients are in short supply. As such, the microorganisms that grow in culture may not reflect their abundance or importance in nature. Behavior in culture may not reflect their role in the environment. Direct analysis of DNA from environmental samples provides more information uh, than just merely culturing them. <clears throat> Finally, we have this program called the Earth Biogenome Project, and it's currently sequencing, sequencing microbial genomes from all over the globe. Now, ecology is the study of interactions of organisms with one another and with their physical environment. Now, the last couple of levels in sort of this hierarchy of life you have population, which are organisms of the same type in one location. Then you have community. This takes up all the organisms in a given area. An ecosystem is really the community and their non-living environment. So this is what we refer to as biotic and abiotic. Uh, non-living uh, environment can include things like water temperature sunlight, um, the acidity of the water, um, basically the temperature of the air, etc. Now there are major ecosystems that include oceans, rivers, lakes, deserts, marshes, grand, uh, grasslands, forests, tundra. And in every one of them you're going to find some type of bacteria. That's when we walk into the next and final top of all of this hierarchical situ, uh, situation. And that is biosphere. That's all ecosystems on the earth. Now within the biosphere, ecosystems vary both in biodiversity, that is the number and variety of species and the distribution, as well as the biomass, that is the weight of all organisms. Microorganisms play a major role in most ecosystems. The role an organism plays in it is its ecological niche. And to just give you an idea, right now we have scientists in Antarctica. They're drilling down beneath the ice to this lake of water that's present underneath all that ice on the continent. And they're finding things things that can withstand the really great cold. And in some cases, they're just assaying or doing a genetic scan. But they're finding that there are living things that exist down there. Now, a microenvironment immediately surrounds an individual microorganism. A lot of times that's difficult to measure. Think about this. You have something that is smaller 
and you have to use a microscope that has um, the oil immersion lens just to see them. And yet, right around their environment, right around the cell itself, there may be differences in that microenvironment. Case in point, Helicobacter pylori. When you think about it, how it survives in the acidity of the stomach, very simple. It just basically releases urease. So it basically covers itself with sort of ammonia ions, which have a more, uh, a greater pH than obviously the hydrochloric acid environment, and it protects itself. Macro environments may be very different. You have anaerobic bacteria cell in a biofilm, and it may survive if the surrounding cells deplete the oxygen. You have fermenters that may produce organic acids that can be used as nutrients by nearby organisms. So in other words, you have some organisms that create the products to keep other organisms alive within that, let's say, biofilm or in something as simple as, let's say, the soil, certain area of soil. Now, as a result, growth factors and genes can be transferred. Living organisms interact with each other in symbiotic relationships. When I say symbiotic, uh, basically that's where two organisms live together. Could be three, could be five, but we'll just break it down to something simple right now. Now, th several different types of symbiotic relationships. Mutualistic, that's where both organisms benefit from the relationship. Excuse me. Commensalistic, that's where one organism benefits, but the other is unaffected. Case in point, you may have seen a uh, uh, shark that has a, looks, looks like a fish attached to its belly. And really what it is, is it's either a pilot fish or a remora. And what these do is they kind of hang on the ride with the shark. When the shark comes up to a feeding frenzy, it, of course, rips and tears and everything else apart. And blood and tissue pieces are, are, are in the water. The fish will detach from the shark, feed off of it, and then reattach to the shark to the next feeding situation. So one benefits, one's not affected. The last one is parasitic. That's where one benefits, but the other is harmed. So human being is the host of a tapeworm. The human being is harmed by this. The tapeworm benefits. Now, organisms are categorized according to their trophic level. The trophic level is really where they get their food. Okay. And it is intimately related to nutrient cycling. Now, there are three general trophic levels, primary producers, consumers, and decomposers. Now, the consumers may have several levels. So if you look there, the energy that's produced to keep this primary producer living is from the sun, photosynthesis. It also may take um, hydrogen sulfide, or ammonia, or other reduced organic chemicals to provide the chemical energy to keep it alive. Now, because it's alive, may then be fed upon and be a food source for the primary consumer. In this case, is our grasshopper. The next consumer level is a secondary consumer, which in this case, it looks like a, uh, a vole, and it feeds on the primary consumer. Finally, the vole is consumed by the, it's consumed by the owl, which is the tertiary consumer. Note that all the arrows lead to the decomposers. This is bacteria, and this is fungi. To put it another way, think about this. It's fall, and you walk through a forest where you have deciduous trees, you know, maples and oaks, and they drop their leaves when the winter comes. So you have all of this leaves all over, all over the place. And yet after the winter, by the action of some of the fungi and bacteria, et cetera, you don't have these big stacks of leaves. You have sort of this little mat of what we call leaf mold. Basically, 
it is not a mold, but it is broken down leaves so that we can recycle the nutrients. Now, primary producers are what they refer to as autotrophs. In essence, they convert CO2 into organic materials. So they fix carbon into the basic organic materials they will need, glucose, fatty acids, etc. Where do they get the energy? Well, a photoautotroph, that tells you right off the bat, it uses sunlight for energy to do these duties. And chemolithoautotrophs, where they get their energy is from inorganic chemicals. They oxidize them. Primary producers serve as food source for consumers and decomposers. Consumers, though, are heterotrophs. They may have one or many food sources. Uh, therefore, they're either going to eat either primary producers or other consumers. Herbivores, they eat plants or algae. They're primary consumers. Carnivores eat herbivores, and they are a secondary consumer. Uh, those that eat other carnivores are tertiary consumers. So we have is this chain of consumption, otherwise we call it a food chain. <clears throat> and when you have interacting food chains, this forms a food web. Decomposers are a little bit different. They're heterotrophs. Yes, they will feed off a variety of organisms. They digest the waste products and remains of the primary producers and consumers. So they're going to specialize by digesting complex materials such as cellulose, uh, muscle tissue, a variety of other molecules, and they convert them into small molecules more easily used by other organisms. They complete the breakdown of organic molecules into inorganic molecules. So you have Ammonia, which is a nitrogen compound, sulfates, phosphates, carbon dioxide. This whole process is called mineralization. Uh, microorganisms, especially bacteria and fungi, play a key role in the decomposition because of the unique metabolic capabilities. Now, this question I had to really think about and I had to convert, where you see the term herbivores. Replace the herbivores, sorry about that, um, with basically um, producers. Okay. Can you have an ecosystem consisting of purely producers? So plants, algae, things like that, and decomposers, so that you have no consumers, no carnivores, no herbivores, no nothing. Think about it this way. Can you have an ecosystem or even maybe a planet composed of just, just um, producers and decomposers? And I pause to let you think about that for a second, but yes, you can. Keep in mind, though, that the amount of energy lost as you go from primary producer to eventually going over and having it die and break down, there's going to be loss of energy. But there's loss of energy as you go from producer to first level um, consumer to second and third and fourth level consumer, which would be going from herbivores to carnivores to carnivores to the apex organism that's a carnivore. The decomposers would just break down whatever's available. Now, Microbes in a low nutrient environment. Gee, these are fairly common in nature. They include lakes, rivers, streams. The microorganisms can grow in dilute aqueous solutions. And this capability is widespread. Most grow in biofilms. You might see them in, uh, let's say, a stream or something, and it looks like a big slime mass. But inside that, calyx of uh, basically uh, sugars and fats and some protein strands, there are bacteria there. But you can't always just take them and try to isolate them from the rest of the biofilm and replicate the growth conditions in the lab. 
Okay. By the way, you can actually grow microbes even in distilled water reservoirs. What do you mean by that? Well, they would extract trace nutrients absorbed from the air. So they basically have this capability to live in low concentrations of nutrients. Their growth would be slow, but they can reach up to seven to the ten, uh, 10 to the seventh number of cells per milliliter. If you think about 10 to the seventh, that's 10 million cells per milliliter. But here's the situation. It's not high enough to result in a cloudy solution. So nine times out of 10, it often goes unnoticed. But these microbes can impact success in laboratory experiments. That's why we have to uh, use autoclaves and other filters to basically remove any of these organisms that might be living in what we think is distilled water. Organisms that can grow in dilute environments are, are called oligotrophs. They contain highly efficient transport systems for nutrient uptake. Sidebar here, a little interesting point. I once worked out in the Worcester area and taught. And the interesting thing is that when individuals wanted to do cultures of basically microorganisms, etc., they had to filter the water, even though it was in pretty good shape. They had to filter out iron because the distilled water, uh, the water that they had used, had a high iron content. So they had to send it through another filtration. Now, let's talk about microbial competition. This is the ability to compete related to the rate of multiplication. In other words, bacteria are going to re, uh, compete, could be fungal cells, but whatever the idea is, those that reproduce fast and those that have the capability to withstand adverse environmental conditions will always come out much better. A lot of times because of the logarithmic growth, and what I mean by that is, you know, one, now let's go through binary fission now, folks. 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, and so forth and so on. That's logarithmic growth. The small differences in generation times quickly produce large differ differences in numbers of cells. If you recall the replication uh, to binary fission for E. coli is only just a matter of about 20 minutes. But there's other cells, other organisms that have a little bit slower and less amount of time uh, to basic or a larger amount of time, excuse me, to basically undergo the replication. And as a result, they can be sort of pushed out of the culture medium, uh, outbred, shall we say. Now, of course, also some microbes use antagonistic strategies to compete. They produce antimicrobials. Bacteriosins kill closely related strains. They may also inhibit competition, but they may also be important in signaling. This is where we get into the, the quorum sensing. You get a bunch of cells that have the same signal. And what happens when you have a certain population and a certain amount of that signaling present in concentration? in the medium, they start making a biofilm. In this case, if you look here at this particular uh, tube, you've got a mixture of bacillus or rod organisms and a mixture also with some coxy, meaning round. Then you take a sample, you put it into fresh medium and what happens? Well, you have a lot more of the coxus than you do of the rod. Take another sample, put it into fresh medium, and what happens? You are now getting pushed out by the rapid re reproduction of the coxy, and there's less and less numbers of the rod or the bacillus. Now, microorganisms and environmental changes. Environmental changes often alter communities. Organism adapted to one environment is likely not well suited for a different one.
Case in point, you might have some organisms that live in very, very hot temperature conditions, thermophilic, for example. Put them down into a temperature of about 4 Celsius, which you have psycho, psychophilic, psychophiles. They're not going to do well. See, growth and metabolism of organisms can cause changes. Nutrients can become depleted. Now, the wastes accumulate, but it's interesting because sometimes those wastes are used by another species. Let's take the example of souring and the putrefaction of milk. Now, if you ever had seen sour milk, what happens? You have a certain bacteria. It's starting to use the lactose for um, its growth media. And as it does, it releases acids, lactic acid particularly. So as the milk starts having its pH drop, one other factor comes into play, and that is the milk solids, particularly casein. And when casein stops being water-soluble, it's a protein, it starts to denature. As it denatures, you get the clumpiness of sour milk. Now, if you look here, you have lactobacilli lactis, and you've moved from a pH of 6.8 to 4. As you have a dropping in the number of organisms, lactobacillus seems to take off. And as a result, you have the pH move from 4 to 3. And as this begins to rise up in the opposite direction, what's going on? Now, mind you, this is over just a period of 14 days. You have the proliferation of yeasts and molds. They are going to start moving forward multiplying in that spoiled milk. Finally, you have some putrefying bacteria, and really they're going to take off as you start moving up in the pH scale, and it goes more toward a neutral pH. All of this in just a matter of 14 days. Microbial communities often grow as biofilms. They're attached to solid substrates, or they will be uh, evident in air-water interfaces, such as like the surface of, uh, let's say, a surface of pond water, something else like that. What you see here is a microbial map. Now, this mat, M-A-T, not M-A-T, what is it? It's a thick, dense, highly organized structure that's composed of distinct layers. In those distinct layers, you, you are able to identify, or by just the colors, the different microbial groups that were present. So you have the areas that were green up here. These were photosynthetic cyanobacteria. Then you start having these pink areas, as you can see here. This is anoxygenic phototropic purple sulfur bacteria. And then if you look toward the lower end right here, you have the obligate anaerobic sulfate reducers. That's the blackened area there. Now you can see these uh, biodiversity of bacteria in various hot springs. For example, Yellowstone and in other places where there are hot springs, uh, geysers, stuff like that. And it is in these areas that you have intense study because some of the products of these different types of organisms can be used to make a variety of industrial and uh, consumer compounds. Yes, even in some cases, antibiotics. When you have such a uh, mishmash or a diversity of organisms, you have to start dealing with what we call metagenomics. Now, you got to understand something now. This is where you can't cultivate and isolate the organism. So you're going to have a kind of like take a biofilm and you're going to add it to an analyzer. And so you're going to get a variety of genomes and genetic information from that collection of different microbes. See, metagenomics is a cultivation independent study of communities or their members by analyzing genetic material taken from the environment. 
One gram of soil, for example, may contain anywhere from 10 to the 4th to 10 to the 7th microbial cells. DNA is extracted, then sequenced, and it's compared to a database, basically what we have isolated and know. You know, the sequence for bacteria that release uh, lipid uh, hydrolyzing enzymes. Um, those that break down and, re and make bacteriosins, et cetera, et cetera. There's two types of information that emerge that you do need to be aware of. One, taxonomic diversity. From the nucleotide sequences of the 16S, which you find in prokaryotes, and the 18S, that's in, in eukaryote genes, what you're really looking at are the RN. A R R N A S, the ribosomal RNAs, those genes for the different organisms. And you can isolate what's eukaryotic, what's prokaryotic, and even going further down from there um, to isolate some other types of bacteria, for example. Now, genetic capabilities, that's a really interesting area because it's determined by analyzing the spectrum of sequence genes in the sample. You will find that there are going to be some that will that'll basically be uh, having genes that look very similar to the genes that we have today and making, oh, uh, breaking down glycogen to make glucose. Or they may be a structural protein. The thing that you have to understand is that also there may be a part of that genetic sequence sample that you say, hey, we've got nothing like this before, so we have to further study it. As I was explaining to some of my students in class, okay, you know those faded genes that you paid so much money for? In some cases, they weren't faded from some ways. They were faded by certain enzymes extracted from bacteria that would begin to remove the indigo. That's the dye that makes blue genes blue. And so it gives it a faded appearance as opposed to spending tremendous amounts of time trying to find other ways to fade the genes, okay? There's another way to analyze this genetic information and that's called fluorescent in situ, meaning in the site, hybridization, short for fish. It's not anything to do with fish per se. But basically, it detects specific sequences or groups. You have a microarray, and it detects genes with known functions. That microarray might be a 96 well plate, it might be a gene chip. And if you run the uh, DNA that you're looking at over that microarray, some of the dots, some of the areas that have uh, DNA that is comparable to the mic, uh, the samples will light up. And there you get an idea about the different genes that may be within that particular sample. Now you notice here, very straightforward, desert, forest, tundra. Okay. So they take a sample of the soil, they add it to the, uh, they, they take a sample in essence of the community in those particular samples, whether it's soil from the desert or soil from the tundra, etc. And then they extract and, and prepare the genomic uh, DNA. They will seek, sequence the DNA fragments to identify microbial inhabitants. They will also analyze the functional genes. This is where they get to determine the roles of microbial inhabitants. Some of them might be able to thrive and in sunlight, others may not. And that's just one example of many. When we talk about marine environments, well, water covers about two thirds of the planet, or actually a little bit more than that, about 70% of the earth. The most abundant aquatic habitat, well, that'll be approximately 95% of the global water now, of course, this includes 
fresh water as well as ocean, so that would be seawater. Let's talk about fresh water first. When we talk about the environments there, you talk about lakes, rivers, and yet they're only a fraction of the aquatic habitat. Deep lakes, oceans have characteristic zones. The upper zone layer may contain growth of photosynthetic microorganisms, including algae and cyanobacteria. So basically, oxygen is going to be much richer in the upper zones of these water bodies. Organic material that they synthesize, though, doesn't stay there. It gradually sinks. And it tends to be metabolized by heterotrophs deeper in the water. Okay? The number of microbes influenced by nutrient content. Well, that's another thing that's important to understand. You see, oligotrophic waters, that is, nutrient poor, limit the growth of autotrophs. Now, a lot of times it's due to the lack of inorganic nutrients. What I mean by that is things like phosphates, nitrates, iron, okay? So you have very few organisms that can flourish. Others are just very, very, um, they're very thrifty when they take in these rare, but seemingly, you know, in other places abundant, uh, ions, you know, phosphate or nitrate, etc. So they can survive in a hostile environment that has limited resources for growth. Now, in deep lakes and oceans, the number of microbes are also influenced by nutrient content. Remember we talked a minute ago about sunlight providing the energy? Well, we'll get more into that in a bit. But here's another thing you got to keep in mind. The number of microbes is influenced by the nutrient content, as I said. And that gives you some idea that you can have too much. A eutrophic waters. Uh, this is nutrient rich, encourage uh, the growth of autotrophs. Now, autotrophs will produce organic compounds that foster growth of heterotrophs in the lower layers. These heterotrophs will begin to really blossom out. They will consume all the oxygen in the water, and they may lead the water to hypoxic conditions. Now, this will lead to the death of other aquatic animals if they don't migrate out of the area. So you have these eutrophic blooms, as they refer to it, or algae blooms. Sometimes these occur as a result of runoff of fertilizers or the removal of lots of organic material. Uh, You'll see this sometimes on farms. A pig farm may have a big mountain of pig manure, and you have heavy rains. And of course, what washes through and the water eventually gets into the streams or whatever is this heavily uh, nutrient um, solution from the pig uh, manure mountain or the pig manure hill or whatever. And uh, that's going to cause certain organisms to grow like mad but then below them you're going to see the biologically um oxygen demand skyrocket and then of course it's going to basically consume all the oxygen the organisms that cannot leave the area end up dying so when i talk about marine environments this ranges from the deep sea to the shallower coastal regions Usually deep sea environments are nutrient poor. The nutrients may be abundant in the coastal regions due to runoff from the land. Seawater contains approximately 3.5% salt versus approximately 0.05% in fresh water. Seawater supports growth of halophilic organisms, in other words, salt-loving. Temperatures may uh, vary widely at the surface. And if you think about this, just take uh, the ocean and not the tropical area. 
of, let's say, the temperate environment. Now, usually when temperatures vary, generally a decrease in depth to about 2C in the deeper water. So here I'm take, talking about, let's say, the Pacific Ocean, and you go the first couple of hundred feet, you get a little bit of sunlight, and then everything starts going dark. But eventually you get to a point in the deepest waters, and the temperature is only 2 degrees Celsius. That means that the organisms either have to be able to withstand those cold temperatures, or they die. Usually what you're talking about for the ocean, marine environments, are oligotrophic organisms. Um, you may have a lack of nutrients, which of course limits growth. Limited organic compounds are produced by photosynthetic organisms, and this is quickly consumed as it descends. So you could have photosynthesis on the top a little bit, but as those cells descend deeper into the darkness, they become food for heterotrophs, but you can't usually see a lot of life at the bottom of the ocean. Few of the nutrients actually reach the sediments below. And you have to understand what we're talking about is half a mile, one mile, one and a half miles, two miles below the surface. Even in the deep sea, marine water oxygen saturation is due to mixing of tides, currents, and wind action. So even if we talk about, you know, there are certain limitations about sunlight and everything else, you do still get a mixing that occurs in marine environments so that oxygen saturation can exist even in the deepest of the waters. Now, if you take a look here in that sh this diagram, if you look at the ecology of inshore areas, they're less stable than deep seas. Now, what I mean by inshore is, let's say, less than half a mile off from the shoreline. But even more so if you talk about, you know, bays and inlets, etc. The problem is in the past we've had where organisms were having these great blasts of growth. Why? Because they were affected by nutrient-rich runoff. Okay? As a result, and it's interesting, you can go over to the Gulf of Mexico, where at the mouth of the Mississippi River, and they will actually categorize and map out areas of dead zones. The dead zones lack fish and other marine life. Why? Because all of these organisms were growing very rapidly because of uh, the, the Mississippi River dumping into the ocean, agricultural, industrial, and other stuff uh, that went into the river and then came out at the delta and then eventually got into the ocean at the, the gulf. So you have the surface having this flourish in spring and summer. The heterotrophs metabolize all the organic compounds created by the algae and cyanobacteria. But as they have this blossoming of growth, they consume all the dissolved oxygen. And as a result, they turn the region hypoxic. So either you have one of two things happen here. As the oxygen levels are dropping, fish migrate away. Those that can't migrate away die and sink to the bottom. Freshwater environments. The types and numbers of microbes depend on multiple factors, light, concentration of oxygen, uh, nutrients, the temperature. Oligotrophic lakes in temperate climates may have anaerobic layers. Now this is due to what they call thermostratification. So think about it this way. If you take, let's say a lake, and you're gonna have seasonal temperature changes. The surface waters are warmed by, during the summer months, and warmer water is less dense than colder water. 
Now, I know you're sitting there going, well, what has this got to do with microbiology? Hang in there for a second. So the e upper layer is called the epilimia, and it's usually oxygen rich. The lower layer is called the hypolimia, and that's anaerobic. Okay, the denser water goes down, and it's not the temperature as much, but the fact that there it's devoid of a lot of organisms. And so the oxygen doesn't get down to the lower levels. Now, what's separating these layers is what they call a thermocline. It's a zone of rapid temperature change. So you see this where the waters basically turn upside down as the weather cools. And so the water that was cold comes up to the top. The water that was warm begins to sink down. So the water mixes and you end up with deep water gains in oxygen. You see this a lot with more non-moving water. And what I mean by that is lakes, ponds, etc. Rivers and streams are generally an uh, excuse me, are generally aerobic. And this is because if you watch a stream or a river, what is it? You're gonna have a lot of water activity. It's gonna be bouncing around in some cases. And so in essence, you get mixing. So you're not going to get a particular layer created. Now let's talk about some specialized aquatic environments. Salt lakes. The Great Salt Lake in Utah has no outlet. So in other words, all the, the uh, rivers, etc., that are in the area empty into the Great Salt Lake. Now, here's the situation that occurs. It's called the Great Salt Lake because the salt concentrations are much higher than that of seawater. That's because as these waters come together, the water evaporates, the solutes, in this case salt, stay behind. So the salt levels build up. You end up with extreme halophiles thriving. By the way, this is not the only place that it occurs. The um, Sea of Galilee in Israel same situation. As a matter of fact, people will go to some of these places because literally if they, they get into the water, they float. There's so much salt that they can't completely sink into the water, okay, compared to our body mass and the salt uh, content. Now, iron uh, springs that contain large quantities of fer ferrous ions. You'll see this once in a while, but they're habitats for species such as Galerionella and Spherotitis. You have sulfur springs. They support both photosynthetic and non-photosynthetic sulfur bacteria. Um, there are communities that are, actually have named sulfur springs. And so they have this high sulfur content in the water. And so you get a specialized area that this particular type of bacteria proliferate in. Now, other aquatic environments include groundwater, stagnant ponds, swimming pools, drainage ditches. It's interesting when we talk about swimming pools. Now, all of these will provide an opportunity for microbial growth. If you have a swimming pool, you'd say, oh, well, to keep bacteria from growing, we throw chlorine in. But what has become popular to a point to replace and get rid of chlorine is with the right materials that you make the pool, obviously, you add salt. And so it becomes so salty, it's like, yeah, I'm just swimming in the ocean, sort of. But also the salts prevent the uh, growth of certain aquatic bacteria that would normally be there if it was just pure water. Now let's talk about the terrestrial, terrestrial um, ecology and the microbiology here. When you look at soil, it's composed of finely ground rock, decaying organic matter, air, water pretty straightforward. But when you get into the soil, you'll see that life includes bacteria, fungi, algae, protozoa, 
worms. Now, by the way, when I mean worms, it could be earthworms, nematodes, a lot of different types of worms, insects, and you're also going to find plant roots. And as I was mentioning to one class today, they found a fungal mass, a single organism that spans several states in northwestern uh, United States. It basically is connected to all the different trees that are present in those areas, and it stretches out very into a very large array. When you look at soil that's fertile, the top six inches are really the fertile soil, and yet they may contain more than two tons of bacteria and fungi per acre, okay? There have been DNA sequencing projects such as the Earth Biogenome Project, and that is increasing our understanding of um, basically the soil microbiology. Now, obviously, there's been a lot of interest in the terrestrial habits of microorganisms. The human interest in soil microbiology stems in part because there's a lot of useful chemicals synthesized by microbes. When you think about it, there's over 500 different antibiotic substances produced by species of Streptomyces. And by the way, to help you understand something, the Myces part would suggest that it has mycelium, that it's fungal. Well, that's just the way the bacteria grows. And yet Streptomyces griseus was uh, one organism that was isolated and you were able to extract of it an antibiotic. Now there's over 50 different uh, bacteria that have applications in medicine, agriculture, and, his and industry. The pharmaceutical industry has tested many thousands of soil microorganisms looking for useful antibiotics. The soil microbes are investigated for ability to degrade toxic uh, chemicals. This is where I talk about bioremediation in the previous lecture. Some of these organisms, though, are not on straight path. Some of them will break down the original material to, shall we say, chemical A. Another organism will break down part of chemical A, use it for food, fuel, whatever, food, energy, or whatever, and then it'll break it down to B. And then another organism will come by and consume B and break it down to simple things like water and carbon dioxide. But bioremediation is an interesting area to study because you have all these opportunities and all these needs to turn around soil that had been contaminated and shouldn't be in contact with people and all this other stuff, and to reinvigorate it and clean it up. Now, soil probably has the greatest range of biosynthetic and biodegradive capabilities. When you talk about the characteristics of soil, how does it form? Well, if you, let's take the top of a mountain, all just granite. So what happens? You have soil forms as the rock weathers. You have microorganisms. They're going to be in working on the, the rock and breaking down by a variety of chemicals. Some of the uh, substances, not as much silica, but I'm sure that there is some use for it but more the phosphate, the nitrates, the sulfur, and even in some cases, some carbon. You also have water and temperature changes. This will cause rock to crack and break. Photosynthetic organisms grow on the surface, synthesize organic compounds. Some of them will die, of course. The bacteria and fungi use carbon sources, produce acids and other chemicals, and these help to degrade the, and decompose the rocks. Now, as, slow, as soil is slowly forming, plants begin to grow in that soil. Now, obviously, when the plants die, they decay, their accumulated organic materials form humus, okay? The soil environment can change abruptly. 
rain, dropped leaves, application of fertilizers. It's interesting to note that you have really a diversity of soils from clay soils to clay loam mix to loam sandy to more sandy soils. Clay soils are more likely to be anaerobic. Sandy soils are more likely to be aerobic. Now, part of this is because you have a greater amount of space in the fine particles and so you can have more oxygen present. With clay soils, you don't have as much of the spacing. Sandy soils, you do. Microorganisms in soil. When we talk about the density, the composition of the soil microbiome can dramatically be affected by environmental conditions. Here's the point, wet soils wet soils are unfavorable for aerobic microbes. Think about it. You, you basically see this big puddle where there was grass. Things start dying because the space is in the soil. Yes, plants have to have some air in that soil. What happens is that the water fills up these spaces and you diminish the air that's in those little pockets throughout the soil structure. When the water content of soil drops to low levels, for example, in drought or in desert, metabolic activities may decrease. Now keep in mind that many species of bacteria, for example, produce survival forms. They either form endospores or cysts that allows them to be resistant to drying. The acidity and temperature and nutrient supply are also important. If you have too great of an acidity, that suppresses bacterial growth. Interestingly enough, though, it'll allow fungi to thrive with less competition. An example of this is mushrooms often appear in a lawn that's fertilized with acid producing fertilizers such as ammonium chloride. And the way to deal with this, this drop in pH, interestingly enough, and, and eventually to eradicate much of the mushrooms, is bring the pH up toward neutral. How do you do that? You add an unusual material, not really unusual, but just interesting. It is calcium sulfate gypsum. Powdered gypsum placed on that soil is not going to hurt the soil but it's gonna move the pH up in such a way that mushrooms won't be able to grow as much. And the calcium sulfate will, will be available as ions for the growing uh, lawn, shall we say. Now we come up into the area called the rhizosphere. To help you understand the rhizosphere, that's the zo zone of soil that adheres to plant roots. So if you can picture where a plant root is, that space right around it. Root cells will secrete organic molecules used by microbes, all right? Higher concentrations of gram negatives are found. Specific types of bacteria are associated with specific plants. With prokaryotes being the most numerous organisms in soil habitats, the physiological diversity allows for colonization of all soil types. Gram-positive organisms generally are more abundant except in the rhizosphere. So in other words, outside of that in other parts of the soil, that's where you're going to find most commonly bacillus. Now remember, bacillus forms endospores. They allow the survival under stress. Streptomyces species produce desiccant resistant conidia. Looks almost like fungi. That's what I was saying before. What they also will produce is geosim. Now geosim is an interesting, um, it's a complex, somewhat almost like lipid, but it vaporizes. Yeah, you'll be able to smell it better as sort of that moist soil after a rain, okay? Streptomyces has also been found to uh, 
produce certain antibiotics. And then we have other organisms such as myxobacteria and the species of Clostridium, Azotobacter, Agrobacterium, and Rhizobium. We'll get back to some of these in a few minutes. We've been talking about bacteria more or less, but biomass of fungi is much greater than prokaryotes. Most fungi are aerobes. They require oxygen. They grow in the top 10 centimeters of soil. And they have the capability to degrade complex macromolecules, including lignin and cellulose. All right. Some of these are free living. Others live symbiotically with other organisms. Now you have mycorrhizas, which are fungi growing in symbiotic relationship with plant roots. They've been found very useful in assisting plant growth. Okay. And this is in part because they create hyphal networks. Okay. Hyphos, remember those little stringy structures that come out of them, the mycelium. And they will link various plants. Uh, what you also have is they provide plants with a mechanism to share signals. Okay. So what you have are fungi that have the capability to interconnect with the various forest trees, etc., such as what I gave you that example earlier about that large mass that exists in the Northwest. And it's all fungi. Now, algae and protozoa are also found in most soils. Algae depends on sunlight for energy. So most of these you're going to find on or near the soil surface. Protozoans do require oxygen. So they're also found near the surface, typically where microbes on which they feed in are plentiful. Okay. Now we're going to start moving into the biochemical cycling. In other words, how certain elements, and then we're going to talk about basically carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, and we're going to mention uh, phosphorus in passing also. But these are pathways the elements take as they flow through biotic and abiotic components of the ecosystem. Remember, biotic is living, abiotic are just the non living components. Okay? These are all important in, in recycling limited amounts of elements. So carbon nitrogen cycles are extremely important and they involve stable gaseous forms. Uh, and in, sadly, in some cases, they do have a global impact. Elements are continually uh, cycled. The interesting thing is energy does not get cycled. Therefore, what you want to have is that uh, you must continually add to the ecosystem to fuel life the energy. So the energy is either going to come from sunlight, if we're photoautotrophs, or it's going to come from elements that are present or chemical compounds. And that's where you get the chemolithoautotrophs. We'll get more back into that in a minute. The thing that you need to be aware of also is that human activities have a major impact. Conversion of nitrogen into ammonia-containing fertilizers has increased food production, but it also alters the nitrogen cycle. To help you understand that, up until about 1900, the major form of nitrogen fertilizer was bird poop, particularly that which is called guano. And a lot of that was taken and scraped off from the Peru and Chilean um, basically the areas where there were a lot of birds and they poop and people would scrape it off and make money. You can still buy that as a fertilizer, but they, but a lot of the learned individuals knew that they could not ever meet the needs of a growing population without finding some other source of a nitrogen fertilizer. So the Haber Frisch method was developed. And what that was is taking nitrogen and hydrogen, putting it over a particular catalyst, which I think was either um, rhodium or nickel. This formed ammonia. And so the farmers, to make wheat, corn, etc., cetera, 
would directly spray this or inject it into the soils. But the problem is you end up with increased amounts of fixed nitrogen, but it doesn't always stay there. It can lead to pollution of lakes, coastal areas, and this is where you get into eutrophication. In other words, the overgrowth of things like algae, etc. And that happens because you have runoff. Let's say the farmer puts uh, fertilizes his field. The next day he gets a heavy rain. The water that runs off will have some of the nitrogen uh, fertilizer, the ammonia containing fertilizer, I should say. And it goes off into stream, to river, to lake. And then you end eutrophication, which is this massive growth of algae, etc. The other issue is burning fossil fuels. Because when you release that vast quantity of CO2, along with other carbon-containing gases, that tends to raise the global temperature by absorbing infrared radiation and reflecting it back to Earth. And this is known as the greenhouse effect. Now, elements have three purposes in metabolism. Biosynthesis as an energy source or as a terminal electron acceptor. Now, biosynthesis, this is basically making biomass. In other words, more cells. Okay? It's required for all organisms and many different biochemical pathways require it. For example, prokaryotes can produce ammonia from nitrogen as a set a group that can do that, that can then be used by the plants to produce amino acids. For an energy source, reduced carbon compounds such as sugars, lipids, amino acids can be used by chemo organotrophs. Okay. Chemolithotrophs, and to help you to distinguish them, organotrophs, these are organisms that are basically getting uh, they're carbon compounds from a variety of organic sources, okay? And that might be sugars, lipids, amino acids. They might be in putrefaction of, let's say, let's go back to our milk example. Chemolithotrophs, when we talk about litho, it usually refers to rocks. So usually what we're talking about here is that we're going to use reduced in organic molecules. These are molecules you would find as you break down rock or soil, etc. And that's where you're going to use hydrogen sulfide, ammonia, and in some cases, yes, hydrogen gas. And finally, if you recall your um, basic metabolic pathway to get from glucose to lots and lots of ATPs, you come up to an area for uh, the electron trans transfer chain, okay? Now, eventually at the end of that chain, you have to have something that will take the terminal electron. If it's cells like you and I, we have oxygen and the oxygen takes the electron and we meet up with two uh, hydrogens and we end up with a molecule of water. That's under aerobic conditions. But what if you're in anaerobic conditions? Well, prokaryotes may use nitrate, nitrite, sulfate, or even carbon dioxide to be the terminal electron acceptor. So let's start off with carbon cycle right off the bat. Now, if you take a moment, look carefully at this under an aerobic condition, you take CO2, it's been made by aerobic respiration. You can then do what is called carbon fixation. And so what you have here is take the carbon as a carbon, the carbon dioxide as a carbon source for biosynthesis. You make a bunch of carbon compounds. If it was in an anaerobic situation, you don't have oxygen present. What are you going to have? You're going to have the carbon fixation again, you're going to reduce the CO2 as a carbon source for biosynthesis. So you're going to make your organic compounds again. Then what happens is going from carbon organic compounds to the carbon dioxide is you may have to use fermentation. If you remember fermentation, 
what happens? You get the beginning of the breakdown of the carbon source, but then you stop. And in fermentation, you produce a waste molecule. That molecule could be ethanol, it could be lactic acid, it could be a variety of other things. But always you're also going to produce a molecule of carbon dioxide. Now, if you go over to using methane, and that's a different grouping, you have methanogenesis. So you reduce the CO2 as the terminal electron acceptor, you end up with methane, CH4. You have methane oxidation. You have oxidation of the methane as an energy source, and now you end up with CO2 again. One of the things you're going to keep in mind is that these elements are either going to play roles to help provide energy, to be the building blocks for the cell, or they are going to be part and parcel of the energy production that is necessary to keep the organism alive. So let's talk about carbon fixation basically is a process to incorporate carbon into molecules used by organisms. Now, without primary producers to convert CO2 into organic molecules, no other organisms could exist. Heterotrophs, now these are organisms that take and get food, energy, or whatever from other sources. Heterotrophs use respiration or fermentation to break down organic molecules. They will, of course, produce CO2. They will also have a type of organic materials that differ in the organism that degrades it. And the level of oxygen determines the type of gases produced. Remember, let's talk about fermentation for half a second more. You take glucose, you break it down, you get to a certain point. Now, yeast, everybody thinks about yeast and goes, oh, yeah, make alcohol. True, true. But the other thing that you can do is use that some of the same brewer's yeast, but you may call it baker's yeast. And basically what that yeast does, if you add it to dough, it will cause the dough to rise. If you look into the sliced bread, you've got lots of holes. Those holes would have had CO2 in them. And the vapors produced by the alcohol basically evaporate out when you bake the bread. Now, carbon cycle. Rapidly multiplying the bacteria often plays the dominant role in degrading sugars, amino acids, and proteins. Now, it's interesting to note that only certain fungi can degrade lignin. Lignin is part of plant cell walls. But you've got to keep in mind that to do this, anaerobic conditions are required. So wood at, at the bottom of a marsh, submerged, resists decay. This is what looks like a fungal mass here. You might see them as tree uh, mushrooms almost. But what they're doing is they are aerobically breaking down the lignin, the cellulose, the hemicellulose, etc., used for nutrients. Now, in methanogenesis and methane oxidation, in anaerobic environments, CO2 is used by methanogens. Now, you usually see this with archaea. So these archaea obtain energy by oxidizing hydrogen gas using CO2 as the terminal electron acceptor. And in that process, they generate methane gas, CH4. Now, the problem is that methane will enter the atmosphere, is oxidized by ultraviolet light and chemical ions, and ends up forming carbon monoxide and CO2. Now, microorganisms called methyltropes use methane as an energy source, and they oxidate, oxidize it to produce CO2. From here, we're going to move into the nitrogen cycle. Now, this can get very confusing, so just hang with me and I'll help you here. 
We have organic nitrogen. Now think about this. Nitrogen is absolutely essential for amino acids. Nitrogen is also present in um, some of the, the basically the nitrogen containing bases that exist for nucleic acids. Okay. So we start here in aerobic conditions, which is where I'm going to go. And so you have nitrate, which is an ion, and it's reduced, the reduction of nitrates as a nitrogen source for biosynthesis, you end up with organic nitrogen. Okay, that sounds great. But we also have ammoniification, and that's the deamination of organic compounds so they can use, be used for catabolism. So you get rid of the NH4. And this NH4 plus means it's an ammonium ion. This can then, in aerobic environments, go through nitrification, and that's the oxidation of ammonia and nitrites as energy sources. So there's one area you can get energy out of. If we go anaerobic down here, we have the nitrates eventually reduced to nitrites. You'll notice that you lose one oxygen. That's because these are reduced when you have this, the nitrate, as a terminal electron acceptor. What can also happen is that it can be also converted straight into nitrogen gas. Okay? Now, if you want to do nitrogen fixation, there are a few organisms that do this, by the way. See, nitrogen is a really big challenge because nitrogen has three stable uh, bonds, covalent bonds. It has a stable triple bond between the two nitrogen atoms. You can't get nitrogen atoms single. Same thing as you have two stable covalent bonds between two oxygen atoms. That's why it's always O2 and N2, etc. So when you have nitrogen fixation, you reduce the N2 to ammonia. And it becomes a nitrogen source for biosynthesis. You see over there, okay? You got to keep in mind that the nitrogen cycle is absolutely essential for as a component of proteins and nucleic acids. Nitrogen fixation. You're always going to have a situation where nitrogen, the gas, is reduced to ammonia. It can be incorporated into cellular material. The enzyme complexes nitrogenase will catalyze these actions. Also, this process requires a tremendous energy, amount of energy, as N2 is very stable triple bond. So you basically have to find uh, enough energy to basically convert, break the bonds, and then incorporate the nitrogen into an ammonia or ammonium um, ion. Here's an interesting point. The atmosphere consists of approximately 80%. It's really more like 79% or 78% nitrogen gas. Relatively few organisms can fix their own nitrogen. All are prokaryotes and they're called diazotrophs. Symbiotic diazotropes form a relationship with higher organisms, especially plants. Uh, some are free living, and so they're members of azotobacter. Some are heterotrophic, they're, uh, they're aerobic. Uh, excuse me, this is for azobacter. They are heterotrophic, aerobic, they have to function in oxygen atmosphere, gram negative rods. They may be the main suppliers of fixed nitrogen in ecosystems that lack plants with nitrogen fixing symbiotes. We'll get more into this in a bit, but what I'm basically saying to you is these are going to be present in places such as grasslands, etc., when there is not other types of plants that would cultivate other types of nitrogen fixing uh, bacteria. Now, the dominant free-living 
aerobic soil diazotrophs are members of the genus Clostridium. Certain cyanobacteria are diazotrophs. They use both nitrogen and carbon from the atmosphere. We have to keep in mind that nitrogen is also fixed with human intervention. And I talked with you about that earlier, making ammonium fertilizer. Now, ammonification is the decomposition process. It converts organic nitrogen into ammonia, okay? In alkaline environments, gaseous ammonia may enter the atmosphere. And in neutral environments, the ammonium is formed and it adheres to negatively charged particles. So I want you to be aware of this. When I say negatively charged particles, it could be soil or it could be the negatively charged membranes that you see on various prokaryotes or eukaryotes. A wide variety of microbes can degrade proteins. Um, common nitrogen containing compounds, they, they break them down to. Um, a lot of these microbes will secrete proteolytic enzymes that break the proteins into short peptides or amino acids. The products are then transported into the cell. The amino groups are stripped away, just releasing the ammonium. Um, you'll see this also used by decomposers. And also, the ammonium can be released into the environment. Now, nitrification, that is basically oxidizing the ammonium, NH, four plus, it's got a, it's a positive ion, to a nitrate, so it's NH3 plus, okay? And this is, and it should be really NH, NO3 plus, excuse me. And this is a group of obligate aerobic bacteria known as nitrifiers. They accom uh, which accomplish uh, this process in a cooperative two-step process. They use ammonium and nitrate, nitrite, as energy sources. And it does not need to occur in anaerobic environments. Nitrification has important consequences for agriculture. Farmers often apply ammonium-containing compounds such as fertilizers. And so the charge adheres to negatively charged sites such as soil particles because you have um, basically the ammonium, which is positively charged. Now, nitrification will convert, uh, converts the ammonium to nitrate. This is readily used by plants, but leaches from the soil by rainwater and hence contaminates uh, the water around. Nitrite, though, is worse. It's toxic. It can combine with hemoglobin in blood, and nitrate is used in some intestinal bacteria and reduced to nitride. What about denitrification? Ooh, this is where we're going to reduce the nitrate, NO3, to gaseous forms such as nitrous oxide, N2O, and molecular nitrogen, N2. This happens when prokaryotes anaerobically respire. In other words, these may be the ones that are facultative. They go from uh, aerobic to anaerobic. They use the nitrate as the terminal electron acceptor. If they were aerobic, they would be using the oxygen as the terminal electron acceptor. When they have depleted oxygen environment, they flip over and use nitrates. The problem is they can have negative environmental and economic impacts. Why? Because under anaerobic conditions, such as wet soils, the denitrifying bacteria reduce the oxidized nitrogen compounds in the fertilizers and release gaseous nitrogen into the atmosphere. So what I'm saying there is basically, if you have flooding, if you've got the whole lawn swamped out and you had just put in your ammonia fertilizer, you're probably going to lose a good amount of that fertilizer. It's going to be converted back to just nitrogen. Now, 
Denitrification may represent 80% of the nitrogen loss from fertilized soils. Nitrous oxide is associated also with global warming. The interesting thing is this process is useful in wastewater treatment to remove nitrate. And we inhibit algae growth due to the wastewater disk. If you remember, we talked about the processing of sewage, etc. You're going to have a particular disk and that's going to break up algae forms of life. And basically, you can reduce the amount of nitrates. That's why also the effluent, if you remember, we talked about this at a sewage treatment plant, the effluent still will go through some type of artificial wetland or ponds, etc., where biochemical breakdown of these particular nutrients will occur. Also, you want to keep in mind that certain bacteria oxidize ammonium under aerobic, in aerobic conditions, using nitrite as the terminal electron acceptor. This reaction is called the NAMOX uh, reaction. It stands for anoxic ammonia oxidation. This tends to then form nitrogen gas. And it might provide an economic means of removing nitrogen compounds during wastewater treatment. Now we move into sulfur. Now, sulfur is found in all living matter. Most of the time when you talk about sulfur, it's incorporated into the amino acids of methionine and cysteine. Now, the key steps of the sulfur cycle depend on prokaryotes and whether you're in an aerobic or anaerobic environment. And by the way, if you see this S0, that means elemental sulfur. Not sulfur as a compound, not sulfur as an ion. Okay. So if we start off here in an aerobic condition with sulfates, these can be converted into organic sulfur, such as amino acids that contain sulfur. As they are broken down, they can be made into hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide can undergo oxidation and you end up with either um, hydrogen sulfide or elemental sulfur as the energy source. Now, by the way, this sounds kind of wackadoodle when, when you first start listening to it, but then you start thinking to yourself, now, wait a minute. There are actual bacteria that have these um, little, uh, almost like vesicles, but they're more structures inside the cell. And those structures contain sulfur, elemental sulfur. Under anaerobic conditions, you have sulfate, and you can have the sulfate assimilation. So you reduce the, the sulfates as a sulfur source for biosynthesis. You end up with elemental sulfur. This can be reduced, and you can use either sulfate or the elemental sulfur as the terminal electron acceptor. If we go through decomposition, the process here will lead us to hydrogen sulfide. Most plants and microbes assimilate uh, sulfur in the form of sulfates, sulfate ion, minus three. Reducing, and then they will incorporate that into their biomass. Now, the decomposition of sulfur-containing amino acids releases the hydrogen sulfide, which is the smelly gas that you, you get. It's um, referred to as a smell of rotten eggs. Now, hydrogen sulfide and elemental sulfur can serve as energy sources for certain chemolithotropes. For example, Begiata, thyrothrix, thyrobacillus oxidized to sulfate, anaerobic marine uh, prokaryotes such as thioplica, oh, excuse me, ploca, and thiomargarita namibiensis.
use sulfur as an energy source and nitrate as the terminal electron acceptor, or they will use sulfate. Now, it's interesting because thiomargarita and nibiensis are some of the largest bacteria cells on the planet. They are actually easier to see. You don't need oil immersion lenses to observe them and analyze them, to just see them. You can use lower power in your microscopy. That's how big they are. Also, photosynthetic green and purple sulfur bacteria. Uh, well, these bacteria anaerobically oxidize sulfur or sulfate. And this is what you're going to have. You're going to have these sulfate-reducing prokaryotes use the sulfate as a terminal electron acceptor and reduce the hydrogen sulfide it's all reduced to hydrogen sulfide. Now, it's going to be a very unpleasant order, but the other problem that you have is if you have a buildup of this hydrogen sulfide, it will react with metals. So it can start breaking down certain metals by forming uh, that metal sulfates, etc., or sulfides. The last area we want to go into is basically some of the other elements, very briefly. Now, we have to have phosphorus. The phosphorus cycle is absolutely essential because it's phosphorus is a component, or phosphates, are a component of nucleic acids, phospholipids, ATP. Most plants and microbes take it, uh, take phosphate up as an orthophosphate. Now, if you look at that, it's a PO4 with a minus 3 charge. Okay? Algae and cyanobacteria are limited in many aquatic environments by low concentrations of phosphorus. Now, this is the biggie. Addition of phosphorus from agricultural runoff, phosphate-containing detergents, and wastewater can cause eutrophication. Uh, I was telling the class, for example, today, there were rivers in Ohio that had gotten so high in the amount of phosphate-containing detergents in the 1960s that you would literally see these huge foam blobs all throughout the river. And that was bad. So they, so what happened was Congress, etc., banned the use of phosphate-containing detergents. Agricultural runoff still does occur, and it depends the type of phosphorus that we're talking about. Is it easy to uh, basically solubilize in water or does it slowly release it? And the slower release ones usually don't give this major runoff. But the fast release will give, uh, uh, odds are, an agricultural runoff. And this water with the phosphates in them will help spur all sorts of growth, usually eutrophication. Now, other important elements that we have to give consideration, and there are some of the, the uh, cycles for them. Iron, calcium, zinc, manganese, cobalt, and yes, even mercury, as it can be recycled by microorganisms. Many prokaryotes have plasmids. Remember, those are the little tiny circles of DNA separate from the major chromosome. And on these plasmids, they code for enzymes that carry out the oxidation of metallic ions. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about the energy flow. So when we talk about energy sources for ecosystems, chemotrophs harvest energy trapped in chemical bonds. Okay, so ATP is generated, but a portion of that energy is lost as heat. We got to keep resupplying energy. Remember, I talked about this at the beginning. Energy is continuously lost from biological systems. It's got to be replaced. So you've got to have something that is going to be uh, providing the energy to maintain biological systems. Now, photosynthesis, that's a piece of cake. All you have to really deal with is radiant uh, energy, sunlight. And that will help provide the energy necessary for the chemical energy in the form of chemical bonds. Some communities lack sunlight, 
like hydrothermal vents or within rocks. They rely on chemolithoautotrophs. Um, harvesting energy of reduced inorganic compounds, they are going to basically use it to form organic compounds. Now, just before we take off onto this, I want you to understand that when you see the volcanic vents, and I'm going to show you a picture of in a second, you're talking one to two miles down, so it's under a lot of pressure. So even though water is coming up through that volcanic vent, it's still liquid, but it's rich in hydrogen sulfide, as you see here. Now, in the hydrothermal vents, basically what this is is created because somewhere down in here is magma that's close enough. Water will get pulled in, heated up to incredible temperatures. And also, what will come out is hydrogen sulfide. The hydrogen sulfide is the energy source. You may still have oxygen used as a terminal electron uh, acceptor. CO2 down here may be the carbon source. Bacteria archaea basically will take this, and then you're going to have the formation of organic compounds as well as sulfide, um, excuse me, sulfate ions. Now, what you have to understand here is, one, yeah, that may be a mile or a mile and a half down deep in the ocean. Rest of that so, so higher up, that's still cold, dark. It's still cold. It's still dark here, but it's not cold because the water coming out of here is hotter than the normal boiling point of water that you would find at, at the sea level. That's because you have one to one and a half uh, miles of water on top of it, so the pressure is great. So it stays in a liquid form, the water that is. What you end up with is a very small ecosystem right around these vents. And also what plays a key role is the bacteria and archaea, because they're going to oxidize the hydrogen sulfide and use that as energy to fix carbon dioxide, to make a carbon fixation, to make carbon compounds. Now, some of these organisms will live in symbiosis in large animals, supplying them with both carbon and an energy source. Microbial populations have been found approximately three kilometers underground also. How do they live? They gain energy from hydrogen produced in the subsurface. Now, if this is found to be widespread, it could indicate large underground microbial populations. I remember reading a paper about this, and they took a bore, and, uh, a drill bore, and went down deep and did some sampling and came back up and they started to inoculate some petri dishes. And lo and behold, they had some organisms that were there. Now this is organisms that were in rock. And we're talking maybe a mile down. And so that's so incredible about that, that they can live that deep down. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is, is talk about some of the uh, bacterial organisms and fungal organisms that play a key role in relationships with plants to help them to proliferate. Now we have mycorrhizals, which are fungi that form symbiotic relations, relationships with plant roots. The fungi help the plants take up phosphorus. And in some cases, they found some examples where some fungi not only take up the phosphorus, but take up nitrate. And then they give it to the plant. The plant, in turn, gives from the root secretions the carbohydrates that the fungi need. And it's estimated that this is seen in over 85% of the vascular plants. As I explained in one class, you can take two pine seedlings, and they're both in sterile soil, and then you add mycorrhiza to one seedling and the other one he let just continuously grow and they're both growing and the one with mycorrhiza is doing much better it's got a wider amount of roots it's got taller growth over the same amount of time meanwhile you've got the scrawny one that's not been treated with mycorrhiza it's doing okay but it's not really as diverse with the root growth or with the stem growth or leaf growth 
There are two major types of mycorrhiza. Endomycorrhiza, the fungi penetrate the root cells and grow within them. The most common form associate with herbaceous plants. What I'm talking about are plants that you could be talking about grasses, you could be talking about clover, you could be talking about tomato plants, you could be talking about trees, etc. Okay? About 100 species of fungi have been found. Most appear to be obligate symbionts, as do some plants. So in other words, they've got to be there. Now, ectomycorrhizas, ecto outside, the fungi grow around the plant cells. And what I'm talking about is the root cells. They form a sheath around the root, the root and associate with certain trees. There's over 5,000 species of fungi, and most of them associate with one type of plant only. Okay? So what you have here, if you can see this diagram, is a split down. Remember, this is vascular plants. Okay? Now, the organisms that are endomycorrhiza, they have their uh, hyphae go deep to various cells, etc. This is a cross section of a root, okay? So you have root cells here, 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 here. Remember that plants are going to make carbohydrates, particularly glucose, okay? You have the ectomycorrhizal, and they will be on mostly the outside. They will penetrate a little bit in for anchoring and communication to the root not as extensive as growing inside and taking up a lot of the occupancy of, let's say, some of these uh, root cells. This is an EM that you can see of an endomycorrhiza inside of a plant root cell. Why is this so important? Because as we have agriculture uh, becoming more and more important in the production of a 8 billion people now on the planet and being able to feed them. Scientific analysis of the microbiology that helps plants grow and produce is critical. You have symbiotic nitrogen fixers in plants. If you grow clover, alfalfa, um, peas, beans, any of the legumes, etc., peanuts, there are certain particular organisms, bacteria called rhizobia, and they have different groupings, but they are basically targeting specific plant roots. They are important in forming symbiotic relationships with these plants and do nitrogen fixing. In other words, taking nitrogen out and making an ammonia. So you can go down to your farmer's market, well, your farmer supply office, and you can find the rhizobia that will allow you to grow alfalfa or clover or peas or beans or peanuts. And usually what they do is they take the seed and they coat them with the rhizobia. It comes out like a powder and you put it into the soil. Now, rhizobia input of soil nitrogen may be approximately 10 times the annual rate of nitrogen fixation of non-symbiotic organisms. Farmers often add appropriate symbiotes to seeds of certain legumes to foster plant growth. It's also seen with alfalfa and clover because both of those can help add nitrogen to the soil. So a farmer will take a particular rhizobium that's set for alfalfa or for clover, inoculate it, put it into the field, and what you get is a much greater increase in the formation of organic nitrogen that when it's plowed in, you have much more fertile fields. Now, plant cells are going to foster nitrogen fixation in rhizobia. And this is by synthesizing a protein called leg 
hemoglobin. Now, this binds to oxygen and protects oxygen-sensitive nitrogenase, the enzyme, in the nodules. And what you have are nodule formations. And these are, you can see them, they look like lumps in the roots. But when you have this formation, it involves extensive chemical communication between the rhizobia and the legume partner. In other words, the plant. So you have bacterial plant communication. The plant root secretions attract appropriate rhizobial species that colonize the roots. Then you have the root hairs. Now, you've probably seen root hairs a little bit. They're much more finer than the roots themselves, but they're sort of the beginning of new roots, but they're very fine and they're very small. And what happens is when root hairs grow out, the bacteria produce what are called nod factors. And this is what causes the root hair to curl and it traps the bacterial cells inside of that. The bacteria pass through the infe uh, their infection thread and the rhizobia travel through the infection threads into the plant cells where they become specialized nitrogen fixing cell called a bacterioid. Now nitrogen fixing nodule forms, the relationship is not obligate, but what it really does is it offers a competitive advantage to both partners. And you can see this here. Here's our plant, here is the process going from step one to step two, to step three, step four. One is you have the nod factors released by the rhizobium and you start having the root hairs and they start curling around and basically sequestering the bacteria. The bacteria will then send out an infection thread that begins to form sort of the symbiosome so they get into the, the root cells and begin to occupy it. Now what's going to happen is we're going to have the formation of the nodule. And that nodule is going to be because you have a lot more of the bacteria that are nitrogen fixing here. And they are going to trig, uh, trigger the formation of bacterioids within some of the symbiosomes. So in other words, the cells go under a certain bit of differentiation. You have a buildup of the uh, rhizobium bacteria here. You can see the, the um, nodules here and here and here. And those are the rhizobium for this particular plant. Now, there are other nitrogen fixing symbionts. There's several genera of non-leguminous trees that have nitrogen fixing root nodules at some stage of their life cycle. Alder and ginkgo trees, they have a bacteria in the genus of Frankia. They do the same thing. In aquatic environments, cyanobacteria are most significant nitrogen fixers. Now, wait a minute, cyanobacteria? This is very important in flooded soils. What requires flooded soils? Growing rice. Rice have been cultivated for centuries without nitrogen containing fertilizer. And this is because of the symbiotic relationship between cyanobacteria, Anabathia azola, and the aquatic fern azola. You see, the bacteria grows in the leaves of the fern and it provides nitrogen. Now, when the farmer, and you remember seeing these pictures of people that plant in the flooded paddy, the rice plants, and what happens there is when they flood the plain, the rice paddy, you're going to have overgrowth uh, with the azola ferns. Now, what's going to happen is subsequently, then the rice are going to grow, they shoot up, and they crowd out the ferns. The ferns will die, but they will release nitrogen into the water. So this is a system that's been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years to grow rice. Okay, so let's 
look at a couple of other things really quickly. Microorganisms and herbivores. Now, here's an interesting point. Why is it that cattle and sheep and deer have this four-sectioned stomach? Well, it's to help them to digest cellulose and hemicellulose of the plant material. Cellulose, hemicellulose, cellulose, these are components that make up plant cell walls. Microbes will inhabit specialized compartments in rumens. This is the first stomach, and it's called a rumen. And this precedes the true stomach. In that rumen, there's about 200 species that inhabit. It functions as sort of an anaerobic fermentation vessel. The microbes have first chance to use the ingested nutrients. The digested materials are degraded into sugars. Now, this is fermented to produce organic acids. And the animal uses the metabolic end products as well as the microbial cells. Oh yes, and they also produce large amounts of gas. They may pass it out through the, uh, basically the anus, you know, is passing of gas, farting, or they may belch it up, okay? But what about non rumens horse, rabbit, etc.? The interesting thing is their structure is a little bit different. They have this expansion uh, around the large intestine called a cecum. Now, the microbes are not going to be used as a food source since this is really after the stomach. But the cecum helps the animal to digest and absorb available nutrients first. For example, and I was mentioning this in the class, the koala bear. Everybody loves the cutesy little koala bears. But the koala bears have this very long cecum extension. What happens there is, you see, koala bears only can eat eucalyptus. But we couldn't because eucalyptus contains a lot of toxic products. How come it doesn't affect the koala bear? Very simple. A lot of this material goes into this extended cecum and by bacteria, etc., are broken down. Okay. And they are also able to get a lot of the water out. So hence, they don't need to drink water. So we are done. That is great. And I just want to remind all of you to prepare for the upcoming uh, quizzes and exams. And I will see you either in lab or in lecture.